Welcome to Things You Don't Know, the podcast that focuses on little-known facts about famous people and events, little-known people and events, and the impact they have had, and always tries to take a different approach and to be entertaining. In this episode, we're going to focus on nursery rhymes and the often dark or macabre origins or hidden meanings in them. Why would we do such a thing? Often we don't think about the imp implications of things we're extremely familiar with. Nursery rhymes are often metaphors for very serious events and serious ideas. Many times they have a far darker meaning. There are several different theories about why nursery rhymes typically have this dark side. One theory stems from the idea that many nursery rhymes popular in the USA have a Germanic origin and may have to do with warnings to children about bad things that might endanger them from incautious behaviors. In a less protective society, children were on their own a lot more, and danger often seemed to lurk everywhere. Jung, the famous Swiss psychologist, expressed the idea that fairy tales came out of something he called the collective unconscious, which is made up of the unconscious mind as well as shared mental concepts. He postulated that the unconscious is populated by archetypes and instincts. An archetype is an ancient primal symbol. Nursery rhymes may also be a way of reminding children of historic events and the dangers in the world in a manner a child could remember and make use of. Whatever the reason, we wanted to take a look at some familiar nursery rhymes, and we will start with... Rock a bye, baby. Reference under the title of Hush a Bye, Baby was in the 1765 book Mother Goose's Melody. It is thought that the song had been around since the mid 1550s. In the book, it was referenced as a tale of caution, as the song was followed by the footnote This may serve as a warning to the proud and ambitious who climb so high that they generally fall at last. Some have also proposed that the song was an allegory concerning political unrest. Some historians say that rock a -bye, baby was not meant to be a nursery rhyme. Instead, it was an allegory about the political unrest during the Glorious Revolution of 1688. The lyrics detailed the hope that James II of Britain's son would not survive and the Stuart dynasty would go away. Hence the words, down will come, baby. One interesting story claims that the Kenyon family of Devonshire, England, made their home in a hollowed-out yew tree. They had eight children. There is a legend that they hollowed out one of the branches of this massive tree and made it into a cradle for their babies. The wind actually would cause the bough to gently rock the cradle to put the infant to sleep it is said the tree still exists today, although it was damaged by fire in the 1930s. Yet another origin story for this rhyme stems from an early European settler who noticed that some Native Americans would carve cradles and place them in low branches of sturdy trees. The next nursery rhyme we will look at is the well-known Three Blind Mice. It is widely thought that this is a reference to the Oxford Martyrs who were three Anglican bishops who refused to renounce their Protestant beliefs and were executed by Mary, Queen of Scots, for blindly following Protestant leanings rather than Catholic ones. In the movie Shrek, the three blind mice are co-opted and given the names Forder, Gorder, and Hoarder. In the movie, the mice have no scars from having their tails cut off. The idea of being scarless could lend credence to being martyrs with incorruptible bodies. Next we will look at Next we will look at Ring Around the Rosy. This rhyme owes its origins to the Europe of the Middle Ages. After World War II, it was thought that the rhyme referenced it itself to the Black Plague, which killed millions. The Ring Around the Rosy was supposed to represent a red colored rash some victims displayed. The posies stood for the many herbs and flowers which were used as prophylactics against the deadly ailment. Ashes are thought to stand for the innumerable deaths or for the fact that the houses and belongings of plague victims were often burned. Others believe in a different origin for the rhyme. The German version of the story speaks about an elder bush, indicating that 
they thought of the Rosie as a plant. Another interesting tale is Jack and Jill. Another interesting tale is Jack and Jill. This tale may be another Norse myth. Hyuki and Bill are taken from the earth by Mani, the Norse name for the moon god. The kidnapping happens as the two children are collecting water from a well. It could have been spread as a tale to keep children from wanting to go out at night. It could also be related to the waxing and waning of the tide. What a story to tell children when you want them to go to bed. A playful romp for water turns into two skull fractures. In Somerset, in the United Kingdom, there is a town called Kilmerson. There is a spot called Jack and Jill Hill, which locals believe inspired the story. Jill becomes pregnant by Jack, but her lover is killed by a boulder when fetching water for them. When Jill dies of a broken heart, the entire town raises their orphaned son. Today, there are six stone markers that line the hill, each with one verse from the poem. At the top of the hill, there is a well and a plaque dedicated to Jack and Jill, as well as two tombstones. The poem, Mary, Mary, Quite Contrary, may relate to Catholic practices secretly maintained in Anglican England. Mary represents the Blessed Virgin, the mother of Jesus. The bells are the sanctus, a word which is Latin for altar bells, which give thanks to the, for the many miracles taking place in the church. The cockle shells stand for the badges pilgrims wear at the shrine of St. James in Spain, and the pretty maids all in a row represent nuns. A darker view is that the torture devices used on Protestant dissenters are referred to. The cockle shells referred to devices placed on reproductive organs. Silver bells were thumbscrews, and the pretty maids were souls lined up to be dispatched by the Halifax giblet. Good heavens, we are discovering a great deal of violence here, my friends. Most children would need a nightlight at this point. Even the benign tale of the three men in the tub cannot escape violence. These clean-minded souls represent the three groups ruined by the Committee of Public Safety during the French Revolution. The butcher, who stands for the well-fed royal family, the baker, who represents the middle class of the nation of shopkeepers, and the candlestick makers, who are the leaders of the Catholic Church. The tragic Mary Queen of Scots may have been the heroine of this nursery rhyme. The cockle shells and silver bells were thought to have been ornaments on a dress given to her by her first husband, the Dauphin of France, who died in 1561, leaving her a widow. The pretty maids all in a row are believed to refer to her ladies-in-waiting, the famous four Marys, Mary Seton, Mary Fleming, Mary Beaton, and Mary Livingston. These four young girls, all of noble and high birth, accompanied her when she traveled to France. They all had Scottish fathers, and two of them had French mothers, and could be relied upon to be loyal to the Scottish Queen and also to her French mother, Mary de Guise. Let us look at a slightly less destructive story. Here we go round the mulberry bush. Now, this is a metaphor for the rather Spartan, harsh regime of exercise imposed on female convicts who had been transported to Australia for such heinous deeds as stealing a loaf of bread or being out after curfew. Uh, by the way, uh, we did an episode on Spartan women, which you should check out. Back to the rhyme. Uh, these women were forced to march around a mulberry bush clothed only in shorts in all types of weather. I wonder if men gathered to watch these topless ladies marching around the bush. I'm quite certain they did. When I was doing research for my doctorate in Australia, I was shown that supposed mulberry bush in front of the prisoner barracks in Sydney. Sadly, there were no bare-chested women present. Ah, uh, such is luck. Even the food supply of a dog can have international uh, implications. Uh, this I gotta hear. The tale of Old Mother Hubbard, looking for a bone for her hungry pet, is said by some scholars to represent Cardinal Wolsey's attempt to convince the Pope to give Henry VIII an annulment from Catherine of Aragon. Putting on my historian's hat here, 
I can tell you there were both religious and political reasons His Holiness refused. Catherine of Aragon's uncle, Charles V, was the Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful king in Europe. He had just sent an army of, to Rome to subdue some rebels. These were discontented nobles who were very unhappy that Pope Clement VII had appointed many relatives to be cardinals and were in fact trying to kidnap them. The emperor was calling in a debt, specifically requesting denying the annulment for essentially saving the pope. As the godfather would say, well, my friend, are you ready to do me this service? There is another rhyme that is surprisingly complex in origin. London Bridge is falling down. Generations have taught children this little rhyme and the actions that have accompanied this rhyme. Uh, perhaps the oldest origin story dates to the Norse saga titled the Heimskringla. According to Heimskringla, Olaf II of Norway destroyed London Bridge in either 1009 or 1014. There is no corroborating evidence outside the Heimskringla uh, concerning that saga. Another a interesting aspect of the rhyme has to do with something called immurement. Excuse me, Dr. Reaver, but what, pray tell, is immurement? Immurement is an ancient practice of encasing a human within a structure. The sacrifice is supposed to keep the building stable. This terrifying idea comes from the concept that a blood sacrifice would keep the buildings upright. Homeless children were often murdered for this ritual. Many European structures have skeletons within their foundations. Historically speaking, London Bridge suffered from a pair of fires within a span of only 33 years. The first of these fires occurred in 1633 and caused significant damage in the weakening of the bridge. Then there was the Great London Fire of six, in 1666. The bridge acted like a fire break, stopping the fire from ravaging South London. Repairs weren't fully completed for a century. So Parliament ordered a replacement bridge, which itself took 58 years to construct. When that bridge was retired in 1971, it was dismantled brick by brick and sent to its new home in Lake Havasaw City in Arizona. At the end of the rhyme, there is a curious line, my fair lady. Many people have proposed ideas as to who this fair lady is. One theory is that this references Matilda of Scotland, who, who was Henry I's consort. She oversaw the construction of several bridges. Another name mentioned is Eleanor of Provence, who had custody of bridge revenues from 1269 to 1281. Yet another name comes from the lay family history concerning an immurement beneath their estate. It has been suggested that the lady was not a woman, but a reference to the River Lay which is a tributary of the tips. There is another strange little nursery rhyme called This Old Man, which seems a little nonsensical and funny. Actually, this may be one of the darkest rhymes we've covered. It may be a rhyme about pedophilia. Think about the words. This old man, he played one. He played knick-knack on my thumb, etc. This Assumed innocence may be a cover for a story about an old man molesting different body parts of children. A nursery rhyme that is thankfully less dark is Mary had a little, a little lamb. This seems to have started with an incident in about 1815. A girl by the name of Mary Sawyer found a sick newborn lamb on her family farm. Mary pleaded with her father to allow her to keep the lamb and nurse it back to health. Her father thought the lamb would die, but Mary was able to restore it to health. The lamb became a personal pet and was very attached to Mary. One day, the lamb followed Mary to school. Mary attempted to conceal the lamb, but when she was called to do some work on the blackboard, the lamb crawled out of hiding and was discovered. The teacher made Mary take the lamb outside, and the lamb patiently waited for Mary until the lunch break, during which Mary took the lamb home. One of her classmates, John Ralston, wrote a poem detailing the day's previous events. That little lamb stayed loyal to Mary and lived its entire life on her family's farm. She mothered three lambs. Tragically, the lamb was killed by a farm cow when she was four. 
Even more tragically, Ralston, the child that penned the famous poem, passed away suddenly at the age of 17. There is some controversy over the authorship of the poem. Sarah Hale, the creator of Thanksgiving and a well-known writer, insisted that she had written the poem, while Mary Sawyer took ownership of the story and said that uh, her friend uh, Ralstone had written it. The house where Sawyer may have written the poem is on display at Henry Ford's Industrial Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Another story may be related to real-life insect study. The tale of Miss Muffet enjoying her curds and whey may come from a young girl named Patience Muffet, who lived in the 16th century. Two origin stories are popular. One says her stepfather, uh, Dr. Thomas Muffet, who wrote the first catalog of insects in Britain, was doing research at the breakfast table when a spider appeared, terrifying patients. Uh, Why on earth Dr. Muffet had to conduct his research during breakfast is a question for bigger minds than ours. Another story relates to Mary, Queen of Scots, who is intimidated by the fiery preaching of the spider of God, John Knox. Our final nursery rhyme has a number of different possibilities as to where it came from. Ba Ba Black Sheep was written down during the 18th century at a time when the United Kingdom was engaged in the odious slave trade. For this reason, the phrase three bags full was understood to mean the gold paid for the newly enslaved. Other scholars have related it to the so-called great custom. A tax on wool in which the price of wool was divided three ways between the monarch, the local church, and the hardworking laborer who actually made it. This tax had been created following the Second Crusade in 1143. The nobility are represented in the story by the master and the dame. The little boy who lives down the lane is the worker. He was originally left entirely broke, but the story was rewritten to allow him a small profit. It has been suggested that the sheep in question being noted as black may have been a reference to people of African descent. We could, of course, go on at far greater length as there are almost innumerable nursery rhymes and many with strange, dark, or perverse origins. For now, this concludes uh, this episode. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you will give us a like and subscribe. Have a great day and join us again. Thank you, friends.